department, and we are pleased um, that they're hosting tonight's lecture in collaboration with the Martin House Restoration Corporation. We have a very long-standing relationship with the Restoration Corporation and with the Martin House even longer. So we are very pleased to um, have Dr. Clary here tonight as a part of uh, this collaboration. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, there is a, a, an AIA, uh, not really AIA, but for architects, there is a continuing education sign-up sheet for which, for this lecture, you can get credits. And that sheet's going around, and you can put your name on it, and, and you can just return it to me at the end of the lecture. That would be very good. Um, next week, the Department of Planning is hosting their Clarkson Chair, uh, Will and Nan Clarkson um, Fund, the Clarkson Chair for Architecture as well as Planning each year. And next week, Dr. Michael Tights, uh, Professor Emeritus from University of California, Berkeley, will be here at 5.30 on Wednesday in the same room and will be a lecture. And I hope to see you back here. Um, I'm going to um, let uh, Eric uh, take on the introduction. And um, I will enjoy the lecture. Thanks again for coming. And uh, we are again pleased to have this collaboration there. Thank you. Anyway, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Eric Jackson Hornburn. I'm the curator for the Martin House Restoration Corporation. Uh, thank you, Mayor Dodd, and I'd also like to thank uh, Ryan Carter, who couldn't be here tonight, and the UB School of Architecture and Planning in general. This series has been an important part of our uh, public outreach this year, and could not have done it without the collegial collaboration of the school, so I'd like to thank them at every opportunity. I'd also like to thank the New York State Council on the Arts for funding for this series. Richard Cleary uh, joins us from the Red State and he's an artist. Blue City. Dragging a red Mustang. Uh, and I also noticed he was wearing a red sweatshirt today. But I don't think any of that means that he's here to, to stunt for any particular candidate. Sure. Uh, no, actually he's here to speak on the topic of uh, Franklin Wright's architecture, particularly building technology in Wright's work, uh, of which we have some outstanding examples here in Buffalo. Uh, that I'm sure you're aware of, but if you haven't been to visit uh, Franklin or Martin House Complex recently, uh, it's always a great time to visit, so we hope to see you there soon. The visitor center for the Martin House Complex, the owner of most of the way back to the is uh, well underway. The envelope of the building is closed as of this week, uh, so it's pretty exciting for us. And if you uh, come to see the Martin House, you get a, a front row seat to see that building take shape. So it's a great time to come. The areas of rights work in general and the history of building technology have both long been um, an interest, research interest of Richard's. So the convergence of the two areas is of particular interest to him. And he's received fellowships from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, and the American Council of Learned Societies for this particular work. Dr. Cleary is a professor and Page Soto and Page Fellow in Architecture at the University of Texas uh, School of Architecture at Austin. He's been there since 1995. Previously, uh, he taught in the Department of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, while in Pennsylvania, he served as um, architectural uh, uh, historian uh, consultant on the restoration of Wright's Hagen House at the Chuck Knob. And a little plug for that, if, you're, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's really well worth a visit. If you're in the neighborhood, so to speak, for falling water, uh, you can't can miss the Chuck Knob. It's really good. Soon after uh, uh, moving to Texas, uh, he produced an exhibition in a catalog called Merchant Prince and Master Builder about the relationship between Edgar Day Hoffman and Michael Wright 
and the many uh, projects that that collaboration produced, uh, aside from falling water and clean falling water in the initial field, uh, in the exhibition that was at the Heinz Architectural Center, um, I had a wonderful, personally, a wonderful experience in seeing that show uh, as a student of Jack Clinton's, uh, stopping in Pittsburgh and then going on to falling water. So that was, I think that was sort of my indoctrination into the right world. So thank you for that. Um, in a past professional life, uh, Richard studied technical theater. I thought it was interesting to, to note that he ended up working with the likes of uh, the Proud of Art Dance Company and the opera, the opera Company in Boston. Um, this combination of experience has inspired an ongoing interest in his in the convergence between dance, uh, theater, and architecture. Fascinating uh, convergence of, of, of disciplines. His most recent publication is called Bridges, a uh, historical survey of bridge design in America. And please join me in welcoming Richard Clare. Well, thank you very much, um, Eric, for that introduction. Um, thanks to the um, Martin House and uh, the School of Architecture for bringing me here. Um, I've been in, had good fortune to uh, be here almost at this time uh, last year, um, courtesy of Greycliffe, uh, and had the opportunity to um, speak to an audience generated by them and to visit that property. And uh, I've been to drawn to Buffalo you know, numerous times over the years. It's a you know architecturally amazingly rich uh, you know city, and it's always a pleasure to to be here. I thank you all for um, finding your way on a Friday night. Uh, to, to a lecture, seven o'clock on a Friday night. Um, and wow, I, that's that's really pretty um, dedicated, and I hope to live up to your expectations uh, to to pull this off. When Eric um, first contacted me about uh, coming this year to speak uh, about right to this audience, uh, he, the he asked that I think about. Um, different ways to approach right. Uh, some, maybe some of you, I know your stu there are students here, um, some of you have been around for a while just you know, looking at right works, but uh, maybe some scholars. Uh, sometimes we reach these you know, impasses or feelings of impasse. Oh man, what's there to do about Frank Lloyd Wright? And you know, a book comes out and a typical book review response is, oh, yet another book about Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, I guess I'll have to review it. And, um, and it's very much true that uh, there's a lot of, um, of, of repetition. And those of you who might be, you know, again, students and writing papers, uh, you may feel kind of frustrated you know, when you just sort of go from source to source. And they're all saying the same things. Like there can be nice things about winding paths and flowing space, um, you know, truth of materials. And those are all good things to know. But uh, as a student or a scholar, sometimes one just says, well, it's a way to get you know, beyond that. And lo and behold, I really uh, deeply believe, and there are a number of scholars working who, who think there are things that um, are yet to be known uh, about Wright, uh, things that uh, can help us you know, and ex explain both the experience of his architecture and really the circumstances in which it came to be. And what I've been uh, working on over the past few years and for more years to come is trying to think about one dimension of Wright's practice. And uh, that, from that is drawn the title, uh, The Art and Craft of Building. Um, I'm interested in uh, you know, what Wright was thinking about uh, when he decides to actually make a building. Um, and the process by which Wright you know, makes decisions or made decisions. Uh, and the kinds of people with whom Wright uh, either chose or by necessity was um, required to interact. Um, we all know that um, when only rare circumstances can an architect um, make a work of architecture by his self or herself. You know, architecture is inherently a collaborative business and not only at the front end of design, um, through the consultants, consulting engineers, and so forth, 
but of course deeply in the act of construction as well. And anywhere along the process, you know, someone can screw up uh, in, a, in a big way. And how an architect negotiates that um, you know, distance between the idea and the realization is one of the fundamental uh, things that you know, we address in our school. Uh, that the profession you know, has to address. And that's, I think, worth revisiting about how we have, uh, as a society and architecture culture, uh, gotten to a particular way of doing business. Now, in the case of, let's see, I guess lights would be good uh, the way that you like them. We're at a wonderful time uh, at, at present uh, to be thinking about Wright's work and um, particularly prairie houses, uh, it, which is my focus uh, this evening um, with you. Uh, as most of you, or many of you may know, the, uh, the Roby House is um, in the late phases of uh, an amazing transformation, uh, restoration to, uh, to uh, restore its, uh, uh, its structural systems uh, as well as its interior. Uh, likewise, uh, just recently in, in Ohio, um, the Westcott House was uh, triumphantly uh, completed as, as a restoration, and it's now possible you know, to see an interior that uh, was almost lost. Uh, the, the fabric of the building was there, but it was so divided in areas that you had no sense of what you know, right space or um, only partial views of what his, his finishes uh, were in this house. So this is something you know, new and, and interesting. Of course, just down the road along, along the lake, you know, Gray Cliff, uh, incredible work being done there. It's later than the you know, true prairie period of the pre-World World War I era, but it's you know, re related uh, certainly in, in time. And uh, also to jump out of the prairie, but stay again within the first decades of Wright's uh, practice in the 20th century, uh, to think of the ongoing work at houses such as the Ennis House. And of course, uh, to come back here to um, the Darwin D. Martin House. Now, the point of just you know, thinking about these publicly accessible Wright properties and their um, amazing uh, works of, of restoration is that when we go to visit them, they allow us to uh, rethink uh, the experiential dimensions of Wright's architecture. You know, they, in the uh, bringing back to life of color, of textures, of, of, of finishes, you know, one gets an entirely different appreciation of, of the house than when it's uh, sort of in a muted uh, condition or a severely you know, compromised condition, as many of these houses were in the time. Or uh, if we just simply know them by, by photographs, uh, however fine and however authentic in terms of the original date, it's uh, a whole nother level of experience to, um, you know, to see these houses. This uh, restoration here in Buffalo of the Martin House uh, and the, you know, the reconstruction of the conservatory uh, is something that you know, absolutely you know, makes the point that you, ab you have to see and be in architecture uh, as opposed to simply look at it. Everybody who studies right you know, has seen the old photographs of the uh, conservatory and uh, the statue at the end. But to walk through this space, as I've had the good fortune of doing last year and again just today with, with, with Eric, uh, and to experience it in, in three dimensions um, is a whole other level of experience. And for this, um, you know, these restorations are, are crucial. There's another dimension um, to them as well, and this is less obvious, but these um, restorations um, are the product of very careful surgery by the uh, contractors and restoration architects um, you know, who are driving the, the project. And through the documentation of the opening of these buildings and then the process of, of closing them back up, you know, we have much you know, new information about how these houses you know, actually uh, were assembled and um, also insights into how they 
have managed to perform uh, as buildings over the years. And my own interest in these questions was really uh, triggered by the opportunity I had back in the mid-1980s to work on the restoration of Kentuck Knob for two years uh, and to really have to take apart a house that was uh, fairly damaged by fire and then to um, you know, help uh, supervise the putting back uh, together. And in that process at Kentuck, uh, I really uh, acquired um, a very direct appreciation for the important role of the uh, craftsmen and women um, who can really make the success of these properties. And I've always felt since then that you know, we want to need, and need to pay attention to that. Now, at one level, you might say, well, this is kind of all nice and academic. Uh, it's nice to know how these houses were put together. But actually, we don't see any of you know, the steel structure uh, in, the, in, in the Martin house. And so it's not part of the immediate experiential dimension of it. So that's kind of an academic knowledge. But on the other hand, I think it's worthwhile to think about uh, how these things go together, because Wright made a point uh, in his career that this sort of thing mattered. Um, throughout his, his, his life, uh, you know, Wright uh, periodically would go public uh, through his writings, uh, where he addresses you know, the, the art of building, uh, the relationship not just to sort of the high-level experiential parts of design, but the importance of uh, you know, the relationship between design and the production of the building, production of the materials, the production of the craftsmanship that goes into making the building. And you know, one can see it from the beginning of his career in 1901 with the famous essay, The Art and Craft of the Machine, uh, and all the way through. And I just put down four uh, bullets of places where you can find uh, write, speaking, writing at length about the uh, importance to him of um, what it is to, to, to build and to build well. Another d reflection of how Wright valued the, um, the idea and the importance of, of building is the way that he cast himself uh, as an architect, uh, particularly in the later uh, years of his life, say from the 1930s uh, on, the last two decades of practice. Um, where Wright would frequently uh, say that he was an engineer or wouldn't demur when someone said, oh, you are an engineer. And he would make much of uh, his engineering prowess. Uh, and you know, for a professional engineer, a PE, uh, that's the kind of stuff that well, makes them, uh, they turn red, uh, actually, when they hear that talk. Because they know that Wright uh, you know, had only a semester of university training um, and just a little bit of baby studies in, in engineering during that time at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, other people uh, you know, close to Wright, uh, including his son-in-law, Wes Peters, um, you know, once remarked that, well, Wright couldn't calculate a beam if his life depended on it. You know, he just didn't know the number crunching side of, of, of engineering. But what he did know was, uh, and we all know this, you know, an incredible intuition, a feeling for how structure um, might, might work. And uh, he did find ways, uh, usually successfully, but not always, uh, to communicate those uh, instincts uh, to either uh, engineers who could help him crunch numbers, as in the case, say, of the Guggenheim Museum or Johnson Wax later on, uh, in his career, or um, capable people, contractors, uh, who could help uh, put those things uh, to, together. But the fact that Wright you know, liked to identify himself uh, with the, the world of engineering is a, is a noteworthy fact. Not all architects will necessarily you know, make that uh, kind of, of claim. Some architects you know, are interested in um, you know, the, the result and the means of how you do it can be more expedient uh, than a matter of ongoing you know, research or concentration. 
So in these discussions uh, in, in Wright's uh, writings, a couple of general themes uh, e emerge that, again, are, uh, these are well known if you've uh, read some of the literature, uh, Wright's writings. He talks about how architects, designers in, in general, you know, must recognize and take command of the machine age. Okay, that's really basic. What he meant, though, also in that uh, is that it was important for designers, architects, you know, to develop uh, working relationships with uh, skilled makers of things, whether they're craft workers uh, or manufacturers that uh, can produce specific things. And at the turn of the 20th century, um, you know, Wright you know, acted on these principles in his associations with such uh, skilled uh, manufacturers as James Miller, uh, who did you know, much of the decorative uh, bronze uh, work for the, the prairie years. Wright also spoke of how the, uh, the form of the thing that you're making, the building elements, ornament, so forth, um, must reflect the uh, means of production. And uh, in this detail from the Roby House, uh, you get that basic idea where he would talk about, rather than doing you know, complex uh, connections in wood trim. Uh, he works with sort of simple, you know, butt ends or uh, simple bevels. Uh, only, you know, here do you have, you know, a slightly more complex uh, joint. But the uh, idea is to try to make the joinery uh, part of a, you know, efficient process. And if the efficiency of the project is one that uh, is such that calls for, uh, you know, cutting your wood by uh, and making your joints by machines or uh, simple uh, jigs with hand saws, uh, then you, you know, design your joints accordingly rather than trying to uh, you know, do something that isn't really within the scope of the means of production that one has in mind. In this, uh, Wright also uh, experimented and in this, I want to show you something that uh, we're right, I think, goes wrong. But the experiment is the idea. And the idea is that ultimately that uh, the materials and the technique uh, of construction are inseparable from design. And Wright uh, would argue that you know, an organic architecture uh, is one in which uh, structure and materials and assembly and final form are all dimensions of the same line of, of thought. Sometimes this comes together in a truly sublime way. This I wanted to show you a case of where something I'm really glad he never got to build this building. Uh, this was a ill-fated project uh, in 1919 for uh, what we call the monolith home. Um, and it was to be all uh, poured concrete. Um, and it's a, just a dog of a building, I think, in any way that you uh, look at. The spaces inside, this is the section that matches this elevation here. Spaces are tight, actually pretty nasty uh, in terms of uh, movement from room to room. He was locked into uh, the um, thinking about how he was going to handle the formwork uh, for this uh, reinforced concrete monolith. And those decisions, I think, about how he was to actually make this building compromised, in this case, the ideas about uh, sort of spatial organization and left little room for refinement of, of, of detail there. And the point is that you write, uh, uh, didn't always get it right the first time. Uh, sometimes not the second time, and that Wright also uh, experimented uh, greatly, even in those first years of the Prairie Years, uh, where he's not so much you know, known for um, uh, you know, the wide range of material uh, in, um, as he would be for, say, reinforced concrete uh, in the second part of his career. Uh, there's Wright's character as a person interested in, in the making of things 
you know, constantly sort of tests stuff, tries materials, drops materials, picks up new materials uh, later on. And this aspect of his career is a fascinating thing to, to trace, um, and it's a kind of tracing that still um, has much to be done uh, from the point of view of, of scholarships. Now, in those early years of the turn of the 20th century, when he was beginning to set up his, his practice and establish his first reputation as uh, an uh, architect making the famous prairie buildings, Wright uh, was working in an interesting environment, uh, in a context. His uh, peers, uh, such as Robert C. Spencer, uh, or his um, employee slash uh, peer, uh, Walter Burley Griffin, were, uh, like him, interested in um, thinking about um, how you can make things and how you may have to change the normal ways of production to accommodate the particular visions that they had in mind. And the uh, example that I want to show you here is that this kind of thinking goes down to the level of you know, the casement you know, window detail. Um, Paul Crudy at the University of Illinois wrote in a wonderful article uh, about casement windows. And at first you might say, oh, geez, how interesting could that be? But what's interesting about that is around the turn of the uh, 20th century, um, casement windows were relatively a new idea in the United States. Um, and in the United States, a problem in the design of casement windows emerged that was not really a problem in England, where casements were common and the idea from which Americans were adapting. The big difference were bugs. Uh, we have bigger, meaner, and more uh, larger numbers of bugs uh, in much, most of the United States than in parts of, of, of Britain. And uh, to deal with bugs, you have to have screens. And uh, the problem with all that is that casement windows, if you have screen windows and you need to open your casement, you have to either you have to take off your screen uh, or find some way to push that window opening. And the simple little detail of the you know, casement window opening was something that had to be uh, really thought through and um, carefully invented uh, to accommodate the interest in casement windows that uh, designers were promoting uh, for largely formal uh, reasons. So as Crudy explains that you know, Wright uh, had to deal with this because he loved the idea of casement windows. Uh, his close friends, uh, uh, Spencer and, uh, and Griffin, went beyond what Wright was uh, just concerned about to actually patent uh, uh, different types of casement window openings. Uh, Spencer ultimately, uh, who was a, an architect of some success in, in, in Chicago, went on to uh, found a uh, hardware company that would flourish for about two decades uh, alongside his architectural practice. And it was in the early stages of this company that Spencer uh, was uh, solicited by Wright to design uh, you know, casement uh, window hardware for the Martin House. Uh, that, unfortunately for Spencer, um, it didn't quite all come together. Uh, and the ultimate uh, contracts, I think, went, went elsewhere. But the, um, the point that uh, you have this world of uh, Wright as a young architect or a youngish architect in his 30s and early 40s, um, is you know, moving through, have, his colleagues are you know, looking beyond simply uh, practice as is and has always been in a certain way, to practice as what, what could be. If there's a need to create hardware for a window type that they find architecturally interesting, they uh, actually try to pursue how to make this uh, kind of thing. And when I've, in this thinking, it's a little bit analogous to a situation you know, we have uh, today. And I suspect your school is interested in this, as ours is at, at UT, in that uh, there are new you know, thing, questions about you know, glazing details uh, or ways of fabricating buildings that uh, 
require details that have not yet been standardized. Um, and uh, architecture students are beginning to sometimes you know, think through not just turning to Sweet's catalog and plug in the closest adaptation, but using the advantages of being able to you know, design 3D and computers and be able to prototype quickly um, you know, with three-dimensional um, you know, fabrication devices, that there are ways to, again, narrow this gap between you know, a design, a need, and a product, and that an architect you know, can be in the middle of this thing as opposed to simply waiting for someone to invent something uh, that then can be, can be used. And so this uh, period of invention is, is a fascinating aspect of Wright's you know, career. Also, uh, another aspect of Wright's work at this point of the turn of the 20th century is uh, his relatively short-lived venture as a, um, you might say, a product designer for the Luxford um, Prism Company. Um, and Dietrich Neumann at Brown University has uh, written a wonderful article about um, the for Prism Company, and these things were uh, glass prisms that were uh, used in the, the fenestration of generally commercial buildings uh, in cities, and they're prisms that were designed to uh, refract light um, more deeply into an interior space than a simple uh, you know, non-prismatic uh, window. And this company, uh, you know, made these kinds of prisms. Uh, it was run by uh, many clients of Wright, or people who would become clients of Wright as well. And Wright was brought on as a designer to create not the prisms themselves or anything to do with the science of the beast, but uh, to uh, you know, style them, uh, to create some distinctive uh, patterns. But the nature of doing this design put Wright you know, at the center of a uh, product uh, process of where he had to think very closely about how these things were manufactured and then ultimately uh, used. So with this kind of activity, a curious uh, architect um, you know, interested in the cause of building, surrounded by acquaintances who also were willing to sort of you know, invent things as they needed to be, picking up work as we see here um, on the the cutting line, what kind of practice uh, does one want to create and did Wright you know, build for himself in the early years of the 20th century, in the, in the prairie years? Now, as someone who is going to set out to, to open his own practice, Wright um, drew on two levels of experience that uh, I don't think were exactly uh, complementary. You'd have to struggle to balance them. The first level of experience was that which he had enjoyed uh, as a teenager, growing up, um, helping out on the family uh, lands in Wisconsin, uh, in the rural area of Spring Green, uh, watching the uh, country masons and country carpenters uh, build the properties for his uh, great aunts. And what he learned as a young man, a teen, uh, was a you know, craft, country craft uh, tradition of, of building. Uh, and he became very fond of that. Uh, he liked the idea of you know, country workmen uh, with their kind of integrity and uh, attention to, to detail. Uh, and it fit in philosophically with Wright's uh, ideas um, from reading John Ruskin about the nobility of the worker. Uh, and the importance of work and the expression of work in good architecture. And when Wright came to Chicago uh, when he was 19 uh, to begin his apprenticeship uh, to become an architect, um, he had this you know, craft tradition in his body, in a sense, uh, uh, was aware of it. But as you all know, I think uh, Wright ultimately ends up working in the office of Adler and Sullivan, which is a far removed place from the world of country carpenters and masons that, uh, that he knew as a young man. Adler and Sullivan was, uh, for Chicago in the 1880s, a modern a firm uh, working on large-scale projects that required um, you know, great distance uh, and discipline and management of these projects uh, through a whole hierarchy of designers, 
draftsmen, uh, construction foremen, contractors, down to the level of the people who made things. And Wright uh, you know, had strong years of experience in this uh, you know, mode of, of practice that tended to actually you know, distance the designer you know, from the end product. The advantage, of course, uh, is that you know, the country craftsman can only work pretty much at one thing at a time. Um, the office model of Adler and Sullivan is capable of large scale of production, not just in one place, but over a, a national scale. And as Wright began to imagine what his architectural practice would be, uh, and over the course of his career, I would argue, uh, he kind of keeps flipping back and forth between uh, this admiration for the uh, small craft scale of doing things, the knowledge uh, and the relationship between the designer and the crafts worker who is his, literally the designer's right-hand man, and right balance that in his mind with the desire to have a national or ultimately an international practice where he would have to, by necessity, design by remote control. Well, the studio that he set up in, in Oak Park was definitely a practice model that uh, was not that of the big office of Adler and, and Sullivan, but nor was it exactly uh, the small country practice. He set up this, this image of a studio rather than an office, uh, a setting for art and craft. And this image that if you've been looking at for a while, I've chosen to show, as I've tried to indicate in the caption, because it, it appears in Wright's um, you know, publication of his early work in 1911, the first published in, in Germany. Uh, and the, the heading for it is his Oak, under the caption of his Oak Park Studio. And it's interesting, this is what he, he chooses to you know, show of what the nature of his studio is. It's a you know, furniture and uh, these uh, dry uh, you know, flower uh, holders that uh, flank it, um, attractively uh, surrounded by um, you know, cuttings of, of greens and things, dried plants. And then in the center is the statue modeled on his uh, uh, son Lloyd uh, by uh, the sculptor Richard Bach, who on occasion actually uh, did work within the studio. Uh, as well as being allied to work uh, outside it. You know, this, this image uh, you know, was meant to the European readers, I think, in Wright's portfolio to uh, you know, show that you know, he is a man of uh, you know, great taste, uh, that the sense of you know, art and, and handcraft are coming um, together. The studio that he created to uh, actually make the Prairie School buildings is interesting in its organization. Uh, Paul Crudy, again, has written a nice, uh, concise article that uh, sums up uh, Wright's studio organization. And one thing that's remarkable about it is the uh, number of people who are really you know, well-qualified architects, uh, literally registered architects, in his uh, early years for a small office. Uh, in Wright's studio, his uh, assistant was Walter Burley Griffin, um, who was a, a trained architect from the University of Illinois, who held uh, one of the first registrations of architecture in architectural practice in Illinois. And also um, Marion Mahoney, uh, who had a professional degree in architecture, although not a, a license at that time. And there was also William Drummond, uh, who, like Griffin, was uh, a registered architect and had come through the realm of experience. There were a couple of others uh, with uh, some serious years of uh, practice training in, in Wright's office. So then on and off, a number of people just working um, as, as, as draftsmen there. Wright's, uh, Wright created for himself in this studio uh, a really very skilled uh, group of assistants, uh, fully accredited in this sort of new world of architectural accreditation that was emerging in Illinois and other parts of the United States in the early 20th century, and uh, you know with good knowledge that Griffin you know could run the office and did, uh, Mahoney uh, could you know execute 
you know, anything that Wright uh, and the office were were putting out. Same with Drummond. You know, they could do site visits, they could supervise construction, the whole nine, nine yards. Uh, and then with the backup force of, of, of draftsmen, uh, the office was well situated to um, you know, produce a pretty wide body of work. Except, and it did, uh, to a point. Uh, and the point came, uh, and the, the beauty of the organization uh, suffered uh, from Wright's own sort of lapses that occur to the actual operation of the practice. Wright had difficulty delegating responsibility. Um, he had a little bit had difficulty also in uh, accepting uh, the initiative of Griffin and Mahoney in particular, and also Drummond to a degree, um, to in giving them room to, to work under his suggestion rather than explicit uh, direction. Wright uh, could sometimes uh, be so involved with a project, uh, that one that he cared about, that he was constantly uh, wanting to keep it in the office and not letting the drawings go out until they were way overdue. Um, Wright was also sometimes a little bit slow on the response of um, to contractors and clients you know, who needed things in a hurry. And th this kinds of lack of, um, of precision in the, uh, the discipline of the firm, a discipline that you know, the Adler and Sullivan firm had really worked out, but this lack of discipline in the firm on Wright's part you know, led uh, even such a devoted set of clients as, as William and Darwin Martin to um, have such remarks as, uh, as this. You know, William wrote uh, Darwin in 1904, certainly if Wright's plans appear to be queer, his business methods are more so. And a year later, Darwin admonished Wright as things were beginning to wrap up here on the uh, Martin House in Buffalo, uh, be punctual, though heavens fall, be punctual. Delays of months running into years are killing. Um, and th this uh, problem uh, that Wright had in sort of the you know, delivery was like the Achilles heel of, of, of his practice. Griffin uh, and Wright sort of reached a breaking point in their relationship in 1906 and um, leaves the practice to set up his own. Mahoney stays sort of with the practice, but on the, on the fringe. Uh, she's kind of in and out. Um, and Wright, um, in 1906, seven, begins to rethink the nature of his practice. And he shifts his practice model, in his mind at least, from one of being a principal uh, among associates, um, which would be the model that he sort of had with Griffin and Mahoney and Drummond, uh, qualified architects working under his supervision, uh, to a model that he would retain for the rest of his career, the vision of um, the master and apprentices, of where you know, he would be the primary source of, of knowledge, um, and his apprentices would be you know, closely monitored and following his, his work. Right, um, in 1908, uh, in his famous essay, The Cause of Architecture, where he sort of lays out his uh, philosophy about um, home design in particular, and then also speaks about you know, his view of what the model architectural practice would be his. Um, you know, he wrote that um, the studio is our little university, um, populated by young people. Um, in every, every case, almost wholly unformed, patiently nursed for years in the atmosphere of the work itself. Um, and this statement in 1908 is definitely wishful thinking uh, on Wright's part, and it completely ignores the, uh, the strengths that had been br you know, brought to that studio by uh, his uh, earlier associates um, who were, came as skilled architects. Um, certainly they developed and learned things working with Wright, but they had their own chops, you might say, that they brought to it. And they were not these sort of you know, sweet innocents uh, who had to be shown, this is a pencil, and this is how you sharpen it. 
Uh, they knew how to do those things, as, long, as well as many others. But Wright, by 1908, was committed in his mind that the ideal practice form for him was going to be one of uh, this master-apprentice model. And he would, as you know, finally realize this uh, in pure form in 1932, when he created the Atelier and Fellowship. Well, uh, Wright couldn't pull this stuff off right away. And as Wright uh, closes his practice in 1909, goes off with Mamma Cheney to Europe, comes back a year later, and tries to reboot, get it going again. And in those early years, 1910, 1911, 1912, Wright, we see him as an architect really improvising in how he's trying to make buildings. He has a major commission in Chicago in those years, the uh, Midway Gardens. And for that, he cobbles together uh, an office that's partly based in Chicago uh, with some assistance. And then he sets up another uh, center, um, and his real nerve center was back in Wisconsin at the, his home in Taliesin, which uh, he began to, to build. And it was at this time in the years 1911, 1912, were these two sides of Wright's um, uh, character as, as an architect uh, definitely reemerge of uh, the master of craft and you know, the master of long distance production or the aspiration uh, to do that. Taliesin uh, was, by building his, his home there, he was able to you know, recreate not just a you know, safe haven for himself, or what he hoped would be a safe haven for himself and Mamie Cheney, um, away from the sort of uh, boundaries that he felt he had been locked into in his practice in Chicago. But he was able to sort of recreate a mode of production that he had observed as a you know, teen in, in Wisconsin, but to tweak that mode of production in a way in that the design vision, uh, which was largely vernacular and intuitive uh, of the country craftsmen, the design vision is now high design, uh, architecture design, uh, then that is transmitted uh, through the hands of the country craftsmen uh, who were building uh, Taliesin. And so we, you know, we see here um, uh, a view of the construction crew uh, around 1911. Um, I like this view of the um, workroom or studio, which no longer is extant uh, at Taliesin. Uh, it was lost in fire. But the, uh, the, the character of the work here, the, uh, the wood framing and then the uh, stone masonry, uh, is definitely a character, as we can see in the stonemasonry here, you know, that celebrates you know, the hands that, that made it. Uh, it's, a, it's a craft uh, tradition, but guided by you know, Wright's um, you know, vision for high design. But lo and behold, at the same time that he's pursuing this at, at, at Taliesin, um, beginning actually before this advertisement in 1915, but beginning uh, around 1911, 1912, Wright is um, uh, engaged in a practice of trying to build by remote control uh, through the system of the American um, system-built houses, uh, where the idea is not exactly uh, prefabrication, but to uh, standardize uh, the, um, the production of the fundamental building materials uh, to cut them to size, to sort of pre-organize them so that they can be shipped to site and then uh, assembled with a, um, fewer decisions in the field than would be normally be required with, then with new construction. And for this amazing project uh, that you write developed in the uh, course of the teens, a number of years, he developed this uh, complex system of um, you know, many different uh, models of houses, that house types and rooms that could be uh, put together in a variety of ways using his standardized palette of, um, of, of building components. And a number of these you know, were, uh, were built uh, until Wright ultimately bailed from the project uh, around 1917 and uh, moved on to, to other things. 
The system built houses is an interesting experiment, and why Wright bailed, whether this project could have continued, um, had uh, an economy been stronger, uh, had the investors had deeper pockets. These are some really interesting open-ended you know, questions for, for beer and speculation uh, about Wright's, Wright's work. But we see him in this case you know, trying to f you know, find a way to um, you know, achieve uh, quality, quality in construction um, without necessarily having to uh, be there and without having to have the sort of same level of um, super talented craftsmen who are required to do you know, the beautiful stonework of something like a, a, a taliesin. When it comes to you know, thinking about um, how buildings were actually made uh, in the uh, early years of the 20th century, the prairie, the prairie years, we, we know most uh, about buildings you know, through research that Jack Quinnan has done on the Larkin building here, and also work that Joe Siri uh, has done on, on Unity Temple. I mean, you can actually find books you know, that talk about you know, the construction process um, and some of the choices that, that Wright made um, in you know, achieving these, these major works. But when it comes to the houses, uh, it's a trickier matter. Almost everyone who knows you know, a little bit about the Roby house knows that there's steel uh, in, these, in, the, in the cantilevers. But beyond that, that statement, uh, the conversation doesn't really go very far uh, because um, we haven't really had a, a, a body of investigation that you know, tells us, OK, you know, we have the steel. We understand you know, how that contributes to the cantilevers and why that's a good thing for, for, for Wright's architecture. But understanding the larger building process, besides just simply having a name of the, of the contractor and being able to identify the steel manufacturer or some of the other material suppliers, um, we have this emptiness uh, in, in our knowledge. Um, and that's, uh, uh, sometimes it's a question because we just don't have information available, but there is uh, information that uh, is available from many of Wright's, uh, of Wright's works that we can uh, begin to study and get a sense of uh, what he was thinking and what kinds of decisions uh, he was making in his practice. In the Tomac House, for example, um, most of the construction drawings uh, survive. And they're, when you first see them, uh, you can see why, well, people don't really want to talk too much uh, about them, unless you're a real construction document you know, wonk uh, here. Because a plate like this is uh, really complicated. Uh, to begin to take apart unless, you know, reading documents, construction documents, is, is, is one's life. But there is, uh, in these, these documents, uh, a, fast, a, a story that is kind of waiting to be, be told. I think it can begin with just simply, you know, the layout of, of the plates. Um, people didn't try to produce, you know, hundreds of sheets for, uh, for, for buildings uh, then, and a lot of information would be crammed into a, a, a plate. And so as you move across a plate, you can be moving in, you know, from sectional views to plan views uh, to elevations uh, as you just move from one section to a next. And it takes a while to become comfortable uh, reading these things. But one be once one begins to, you know, to read them, um, you get a sense of you know, where the, the key decision points for um, right were of where something had to be made explicit for the, the building, uh, you know, the contractors, as opposed to things that could just simply be, you know, indicated, and then they knew how to do it because uh, standard construction process is being uh, followed. Window details uh, for Wright uh, were really a major, a major issue. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, with another example in the Willits House. But um, you can see you know, window details being established uh, here. 
and Wright had an attitude uh, towards the, um, the kind of basic framing elements he wanted to have in a, in a window and the process of assembly based again on these principles he had of how the uh, basic you know, pieces of a thing have to be put together in a way that relates to how they're um, actually being manufactured or, or cut or milled on site. Um, House also, uh, you know, drawings like this are, are fascinating. We're looking at the same, um, this is the section you know, through here that we're seeing uh, blown up here, looking at the uh, window. Um, this is a little corridor through here where this range of windows from the exterior, this is that space that's running through here, uh, can be seen. Up in this corner uh, is a steel uh, detail. This uh, house has, like the Roby house that comes after, has long cantilevers at the ends. And uh, exactly how that is, those connections are to be made, well, it was a matter that had to be studied and then fairly precisely uh, explained because it was not you know, the standard uh, detail of, um, of house construction at the time. So there's a, a body of information that uh, exists. In, it exists more or less in, in its complete form at the ar archives of the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, Association and um, Foundation in um, Arizona. Many, many of these drawings have, have been published, um, but the trick in studying is that we usually don't have publication of full drawing sets. Uh, so we'll have you know, publication of two plates out of a nine plate set and uh, it takes, it's difficult to be able to you know, haul off to uh, Arizona to look at the other plates or to uh, order, order photographs. And until, um, but th there's value I think that can happen uh, by looking more closely at the overall uh, process of what was sent out you know, to a contractor, to a client, and then trying to work backwards and think about what are the decision points that Wright and his office you know, were making as they began to go from the idea of a building, its general form and characteristics, to its, its realization. Great information, though, is coming out through the restoration works, uh, such as we see you know, here in, in Buffalo, in the northwest corner of, of the Martin House, um, where the house is you know, open, opened up. Uh, you can see, see steel uh, that's now been cut back, uh, brick, concrete, wood framing, uh, partitioning, uh, a variety of, of, of materials. And this is the next step in this project of um, replacing a, a steelwork in this corner of the house. The problem is that um, we have a gap right now in the, between the contractors and the restoration preservation architects who are focused on the, these projects and the larger world of uh, scholars and general public in getting the information that they've learned in, in the field. Uh, preservation architects and contractors don't have much of a tradition of really writing about the, the, the work, or sometimes they'll write about it in very, very specific ways of, of how they solved a problem. But their job is to sort of focus on the problem and then move on. Scholars' job, uh, jobs are to sort of step back and, and see how the individual pieces fit into a, a larger puzzle. And there's, there's a gap that uh, is something that would be good to close uh, between this wonderful work and technical knowledge that's being amassed across the country on Wright's work and the you know, thinking about like, how does it matter to his overall career. Um, how does it really help us understand you know, Wright's thinking um, as an architect? What can be learned uh, from this? So the state of the, of the, of the question that we have in um, architectural thought on Wright's, Wright's work is fairly limited. Some of it goes back uh, to work that Rainer Bannum uh, did, I think maybe when Bannum was still here in Buffalo, um, 1969 wrote the famous article that you know I assign and I suspect you know those of you who are students and uh, faculty is, have, have assigned um, the article on the uh, Roby House uh, that comes from the architecture of the well-tempered environment uh, published in 69 where uh, Bannum picks up on um, Wright's ability to integrate systems and 
I want to read just a, a, a brief statement that um, triggered Bannum's thinking and that still provides a uh, motivation for things to look at as we investigate Wright's work. In 1910, Wright uh, uh, published in his German portfolio of his, of his work this uh, statement. Another modern opportunity is afforded by our effective system of hot water heating. By this means, the forms of buildings may be more completely articulated with light and air on several sides. By keeping the ceilings low, the walls may be opened with a series of windows to the outer air, the flowers and trees, the prospects, and one may live as comfortably as formerly, less shut in. It is also possible to spread the buildings, which once in our climate of extremes were a compact box cut into compartments, into a more organic expression, making a house in a garden or the country the delightful thing in relation to either or both that imagination would have it. Bannum was struck, uh, and this is a remarkable thing about Wright's uh, work, of his instinct uh, and desire to integrate you know, mechanical systems such as uh, heating uh, and uh, you know, natural passive systems so that we talk about you know, with uh, you know, airflow and, and, and solar, solar shading into his design aesthetic. The point is not to solve these things sequentially, but to see them as a whole. The point of the building is to make someone comfortable, environmentally comfortable, but psychologically comfortable. So to set up, you know, you're thinking about views out of your building at the same time, you're thinking about how you, your environmental systems are going to, to, to operate. And indeed, in the Roby House, and this is the famous section that, that uh, Bannum you know, published, of where you know, he then enumerates the you know, cross ventilation, the, uh, the role of the overhangs, uh, the way that you know, heat moves into the eaves, um, some drawn, in fact, possibly by these um, lighting fixtures that are set in the, the eaves, a whole l register of things that uh, Bannum sketched out in one house. However, if you say, well, gee, this is really interesting for, for the Roby house, um, and how did this play out in the Martin house? Uh, how did this play out in um, any other of the major you know, prairie houses you might think of? Um, we don't have that. Uh, it's this, this thought, this gener point of departure has been set up, but this is something that one could you know, really uh, in investigate. But the key, I think, to those investigations is not just to go in the um, problem-solving way of, oh, what is, what is the thermal response uh, of Wright's houses, or how does he deal with, with light as an isolated issue, but to keep focusing, as Wright insisted upon doing, on the, the integration of these, of these elements. The other uh, state of the, uh, the question it has been addressed in most uh, successfully, uh, I think, by Edward Ford in the uh, you know, trusty Details of Modern Architecture book, where again he lays out a, a, a direction for talking and thinking about Wright's uh, construction. Ford notes that in um, works like the, the Willits House uh, here uh, and other, um, particularly the frame houses of the prairie years, Wright tended to be working with an attitude of modifying normative construction. So he doesn't set out to reinvent the uh, platform frame for wood framing, but rather he looks to adapt it uh, and integrate it into, into his, his vision. Uh, in the case of the, the Willits House, you, one of the details that Ford uh, selects uh, is that detail I mentioned uh, earlier about the you know, simplification of, of, of window um, molding elements to uh, ultimately try to reduce the number of, of parts that are required to frame a, a traditional window in this uh, time of 1902, um, and also to handle the joints and the, uh, uh, the, the edges in a way that makes sense for the, the mode of, of, of production of how these things were to be actually milled and to present them uh, as, as simply and directly as, as, as possible. 
Ford also uh, points out this uh, issue, second point that Wright was uh, fascinated with, and that had to do with the, uh, the representation of structural systems uh, on the interiors of his house, not by showing us the actual uh, beam, structural beam, but uh, you know, showing us where it is or suggesting its, its presence. And so in, in this detail um, here in the, uh, the Roby House living, uh, the Willits House living room, where uh, the space is, is, is divided by these two beams that are doing you know, major work to hold up uh, what's above. Um, right, it drops it, but this is a, a box beam uh, that's actually below. Here's the trim, uh, and this is the actual eye beam that's, that's above it. He indicates it um, through as an expressive uh, idea. It helps articulate the uh, organization of the room, as, say, any kind of cove treatment might do. But the placement of it uh, is you know, deliberate and related to the constructive system. And here in, in, in Buffalo, um, you know, where the idea is no longer a, a Martin house, a building that's about the, you know, the balloon frame, but it's an ode to brick, um, the uh, Wright was interested in trying to um, explore uh, you know, the nature of, of, of brick construction, but then integrate it with in an exploration with concrete and steel, uh, and then using uh, framing, um, stud wall framing, as a essential infill uh, way to uh, between these, these primary structural elements. On the aesthetic level of thinking about the um, the building and the ode to brick, you know, Wright uh, said, you know, brick uh, lends itself to articulation and plan, and uh, its 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 character uh, was fascinating to him for it sets up all these opportunities for uh, for corners and this you know, wonderfully uh, visually rich, experientially fantastic uh, setup of forms. Um, defining the exterior of the building, but also of complex ways that you can read the interior space you know, through the device of the, of the brick um, pier. Beyond this uh, celebration of brick, though, uh, Wright was in interested in investigating uh, and integrating you know, the materials of uh, concrete and steel that we see um, represented you know, here. Steel is a hidden material in the um, in the house, uh, concrete as one that is shown and sometimes not shown, uh, brick uh, being the sort of dominant um, form. So the issue of uh, here is that in the, the the Martin House in particular represents uh, you know, the suggestion of, of a direction of, of right for you know looking ways to um, to, to integrate new families. Of, of building materials and even to bring them into the world of, of, of domestic architecture. What and how systematically this desire to sort of bring in these different forms into his work um, was in Wright's practice in the early 20th century is still something that, uh, again, has not been really thought through. We have this amazing example uh, of, of the Martin House. But and we know a lot now about you know, how it was put together, but how its material treatments you know, relate to the broader families of, of prairie houses is something that's worth you know stepping back and, and thinking about. And so um, you know we come to uh, this point I wanted to make at the end of um, the world of the builder and, and the craftsman in in, in making these buildings. This is a view that uh, Jack Quinnens published of uh, the construction crew at the um, Martin House. And you know, who were these guys? Um, we know the name of the contractor, O.S. Lang. Um, we know not that much about him, uh, his career. Uh, there's enough uh, suggestions in his correspondence uh, with um, 
Wright in Wright's office and, and with Darwin Martin that gives us a little indication of his character. But what kind of man is really drawn to uh, this, this task of, of building such, uh, such a house? Clearly, um, Lang hoped to make money uh, off the project. He was a contractor. It's his, his job. It's how he earns his living. But he was also someone who took, um, it's clear from his correspondence, you know, a special pride in this particular work. So, okay, we know a little bit about uh, the name and a few scraps of information about the aspirations of this contractor who was uh, working for Wright and, and Martin. But who are these guys? Uh, and you know, what did they bring to, 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 to the process? And exactly how were they actually all organized um, into uh, a, a production um, team? The sometimes rich documentation that we can have with, with Wright's buildings or our fascination with Wright's work provides us an opportunity to you know, ask questions to look more broadly into what um, sometimes is called the culture of, of building. And that's the idea that there, to make, actually make architecture, um, to get off the ground, one needs the you know, attention and caring uh, work of a broad number of, of suppliers, of you know, local contractors, um, and others who have to be brought into some, some coordination. Uh, how did Wright know which materials to select for, say, his, uh, the, the glass that was used in the, in the bathrooms of the Martin House? Well, when did these come to his attention? Why were they on his radar? How could he possibly convince uh, his client to, 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 to use this stuff? Sometimes the client brings ideas to Wright about a new material, um, and then how does Wright respond and integrate it into his practice? Th these questions uh, you know, take us into a you know, broader you know, role that uh, we generally, as we work today in our own lives, we just take for, for granted. You know, we carry this vast amount of information in our heads. We see things, we react to them, uh, we sort of absorb them and put them into the practices that you all uh, you know, either do or, or are aspiring to do, or if you're just you know, a, a homeowner, you know, the vision that you have when you want to change that kitchen into something else. But it's all part of a large network. And these networks are uh, things that um, can be you know, stepped back and, and, and analyzed and to see you know, what things were coming to the fore that would lead a decision to go one way or, or, or the other way. So Wright is our focus. Um, he was you know, the artistic genius, in a sense, who uh, had the vision, uh, coupled with the vision of his clients to uh, achieve the work. But there was this whole supporting structure without which um, neither vision, the vision of the client nor the vision of, of the architect, could be realized. So these are some directions to, to think about in the, uh, the world of you know, right and the craft of building. So thank you very much for your attention and inviting me to Buffalo. If you have any questions, I know it's uh, seven. Some of you are hungry. Some of you are probably sleepy. Um, but I'd be happy to try to answer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Wright did use uh, specifications. Uh, and as one might expect, the specifications uh, can sometimes be more detailed, along with the drawing sets being more detailed, the farther away the work is from Oak Park uh, in those early, early years. So specifications can be quite, um, uh, quite helpful. Specifications tend not to be as detailed as specifications that are written today, so they aren't as long. Uh, and so there was a lot of information that would be brought into, into the process um, as, as the project was, was going. And trying to you know, capture that information is, is, is tricky, because some of it was by verbal communication. Um, Eric and I were talking about today, in the case of the Martin House, where there's amazing written documentation, but there's also the telephone and um, some of the gaps that we have, I think, in the written record uh, were filled in the real life by people picking up the phone uh, or actually having a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, 
that that way. Yes. Yes, and eggs. That is an excellent question, and that is uh, uh, something that is uh, semi semi accurate. Uh, it, uh, <coughs> the system that Wright had in place, the, the drawings for for Kentuck Knob, um, reasonably well you know, set up to, to be able to build to build the building. There was a critical stage where um, Wright in did insist that supervision happen. Not his supervision, because Wright only visited the building once, uh, and the building was already out of the ground uh, at that point. But um, he sent a, a, a key apprentice uh, to the site at the time that the, uh, the, the owner, the Hagens, uh, and their uh, stonemasons were beginning to think about uh, what stone they were going to use. And in the selection of the stone, the stone for Kentuck Knob comes out of um, its uh, field of stone in a, in a woods that's about a mile from the house. They went into the field, sp split the stone, and hauled it to the job site. Uh, you know, the whole process it was not quarried stone. It was just taken out of stuff that they had to get into the woods and pull back. Um, but Davy Davison um, first went and approved that selection of the stone. And then he came back at the point where they had assembled enough stone and they were starting to do the stone masonry. And he supervised the construction of the first wall um, of, of, of the house, which uh, was, was crucial to uh, make sure that the stone masons understood the rhythm. Because the uh, uh, the stone masonry, the right stone masonry is not drawn like one to one. I mean, you, you can't do it particularly for the kind of stone masonry he wants. It's like a, a jazz musician, you've got to feel it. And so Wright used his apprentices, or when he was younger or working closer to home, uh, you know, Wright would supervise himself, you know, to have those guys put up a, a wall and then take it down if the rhythm's not right. So that sign off, you know, happened. And then the rest of the house, um, yeah, the, the contractor, uh, Herman Keyes, he was like in his 70s. He was a, just a guy who built dairy buildings for the dairy company. Um, he was really good, and he took an interest. Uh, the, the kind of level of craftsmanship Wright was calling for in the work really appealed to him, and you know, he more than rose to the occasion, as did the uh, craftsmen and women who worked on the restoration. They were all country workers. They weren't brought in from the big cities. Um, and those, those people, you know, the ones who stayed on the job, and they got it and um, did just incredible work. And they were intrigued by the geometries. They, they could feel it. And Wright gives enough of a system uh, in those Usonian houses in particular that you don't, once you understand the system, you know what to do um, there. The, the, the liberties were taken in the bathroom where uh, they just gave up and trying to figure out where the walls were going to go. Um, and they punted, the contractor punted. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. About. The floor of water that the, the uh, contractor doubted the intuition of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. The special to steel, and it was actually adding steel uh, to the cantilever just so that he felt it would be safe. And he was right. The contractor. Yeah. The, as the uh, contractor, the story of falling water. Those of you who followed, been there for followed the restoration thing. This was one of Wright's uh, major um, slip-ups in, in the office. And um, I, I've been working as part of, part of this large project that I'm trying to get my hands on, on one of Wright's um, engineers, Mendel Glickman. He was a, a registered engineer. And uh, I've all had, you wonder, like, how could they screw up? Because they really fundamentally underestimated the amount of reinforcing that had to be in those cantilevers. I and mean, it was a major screw up. And um, when I read the, some correspondence with uh, Wright and Glickman, it came clear that like Wright, Glickman had his own engineering practice and was working in Milwaukee at the time that they were doing the design development on falling water. And they were doing that in Taliesin. And uh, uh, 
Edgar Taffel uh, like runs in to Glickman uh, in Madison or something and says, oh, we're doing a job in concrete and Mr. Wright would like to know if you could do some detailing. And, and Glickman then wrote a letter saying, well, I'm real busy in Milwaukee right now, but you can send me the drawings and I can do it over the weekend or something. And so, you know, this sort of rough specifications that they were developing for falling water, you know, sent to some guy, I mean, qualified is certainly qualified, but without like the kind of back and forth you're going to, you'd expect. And so he did what you know, he did on his information that he had, and the, the check loop, you know, was left woefully incomplete. Uh, and as the design development moved on, and some things changed, uh, and the assumptions made on this, on this detail on the steel, you know, were inadequate, it, it just went, went through. And so, yeah, it was the, the contractor who had sort of a gut reaction, but more, that was complemented by in a, uh, Edgar Sr., the client, uh, he just was wondering about this, and being concerned and as obsessive in his way as Darwin Martin was in his own way years before, um, uh, Kaufman sent um, the construction documents to um, uh, an engineering firm in Pittsburgh, a steel engineering firm, and they said, no, there's not enough you know, reinforcement here. And that gave the uh, contractor and Kaufman the sort of backbone to order more reinforcement. And then they kind of split the difference, and they didn't put it all in. Um, so they thought, well, okay, we'll put more than Mr. Wright wanted, but not as much as these engineers wanted. And it turned out the engineers were dead right. Um, and the building sagged and had to be saved as it has been now. So yeah, it was not a perfect, not necessarily a pretty office in the way it operated sometimes. Um, you guys in the back are okay? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much.